Ghost of Tsushima has finally arrived as a port on PC, and I'm happy to tell you that it's pretty good. The port, the game itself is excellent, there are some issues, but I do recommend the game if you can play it because of those PSN restrictions, more details on that mess at the end of the video. So I'm going to start off by giving you a brief review of the game on if it's worth playing at all, and then I'm going to tell you about the technical aspects of the port, and then we'll talk about that. By the way, hi, I'm Mug Thief. welcome to the video. So Ghost of Tsushima is an open world samurai ninja game that more or less imitates the Ubisoft open world template. It is set at the end of the 13th century on the island of Tsushima in Japan, fighting back against a Mongol invasion. Now, if you were afraid when I mentioned Ubisoft, don't worry, because in my opinion, this is one of the most refined versions of that Ubisoft open world template that we've ever had. This game is very free of bloat and useless things to do, and instead offers an absolutely beautiful world to explore that is quite dense, tightly packed, has many quality of life features, with many different things to do, all of which feel rewarding and meaningful to your character progression, a progression that, by the way, is also exceptional. You will roam the island of Tsushima, taking on different tasks, finding different side quests, and a lot of different activities that all serve to upgrade your character in one way or another, be that small platforming challenges, be that little mini games, and then you will tackle primary missions which advance the story, which is anywhere between entertaining to really good depending on who you ask, as you fight to liberate the island of Tsushima from those Mongol invaders. It features a colorful cast of characters that have interesting stories to tell and that all make a lot of sense in interacting with Jin Sakai, the protagonist of the game, and it all leads to a satisfying conclusion. And I do not have anything to offer on the additional director's cut content, which is the island of Ika, I believe, which I will be playing later when I continue playing through the game. However, even if I haven't finished the game again, what I can tell you is that this is just a spectacular game and in my opinion is actually quite underrated. And I am very aware that most people rate this game somewhere between an 8 and a 9, and yes, I will repeat it, I think it's underrated. This is some of the best refinement of open world game design that I've ever seen, all combined with a combat system that is on the simpler side, but is very satisfying and does get pretty complicated even if it takes a while to ramp up in that complexity. And a stealth system, because this game involves a lot of stealth. Yes, the type of stealth that you probably miss from things like Assassin's Creed. And those stealth systems are also relatively simple, but very stylish, very satisfying to pull off. And it all feeds into this overall progression and exploration that is just sublime. This is all helped by the fact that this is one of the most beautiful games I have ever played. It was back when I played it on PS4, and now that we can play it at higher resolutions and with ultra-wide resolutions, it's even more beautiful today. For me, the open world of Tsushima and the open world of Tears of the Kingdom slash Breath of the Wild are the most beautiful and most entertaining open worlds that there have been to explore. I know very subjective, but when it comes to how they look, it is about the art style. It is about the artistic design of the game, the variety and the overall world design and how it interacts with your character that makes them stand out, even if both Zelda and Ghost of Tsushima are not the most graphically intensive games ever made. This is not a game about photorealism, but it is just dripping in style, which is one of the most important parts of the game overall. This game has a penchant for the cinematic all of the time. Your combat sequences, every single cutscene, even minor interactions with side quests all feel like they were designed to be part of a top tier movie that would stand out for its photography. Careful attention to framing and lighting is everywhere in the game and the way that it frequently manages to frame all of your combat and your stealth in a way that feels so cinematic while never feeling like that's a gimmick of the game, it's just kind of like a coincidence, is something that does not receive enough praise in my opinion. And if you like looking at pretty things while playing fun video games, especially if you like the idea of samurai and ninja, you should really play Ghost of Tsushima. If not right now, at least put it on your wish list, wait for it to be on sale, but this is an experience that you should not miss out on. Heck, I'm finding myself so sucked into the game all over again that I'm seriously considering doing one of my big hour-long analyses on the game breaking down everything in it because it's just that good. Which is a great excuse to remind you that if you'd like to watch a video like that or want to watch the ones I've already made, 
you can subscribe or check out the channel. Now let's talk about PC performance and the options menu. There is quite a number of different options here, maybe not as many as some people would like to see, but you have your usuals from shadows to anti-aliasing to ambient occlusion to water, a pretty long list of things that you can tweak up and down to meet somewhere in the middle when it comes to performance and graphical fidelity. It does feature DLSS 3, AMD FSR 3.0, as well as Intel XESS, which are all upscaling methods that we continue to rely on more and more in gaming, both on console and PC, for those dynamic resolutions and that upscaling to really get better performance while compromising very little of the visual quality. All of those are there, including frame generation for DLSS, and it's all very well implemented. You have quite a host of different options for your audio, which is important because the audio in this game is also excellent. And of course, different resolution options. They did say in the trader that it would support ultra wide resolution. Just in case you are one of the other five people like me, the game does support 32 by 9 natively. In my case, that is 5120 by 1440. The game looks absolutely beautiful in it. What you're seeing is that cropped with the HUD set to 21 by 9, but I do have much more screen on the sides when I'm playing the game. I don't upload videos in that resolution because I like people to watch my videos and I think 21 by 9 for some people is already weird enough, but it does have that support. That's always for me uh, kind of a sign that these guys uh, took it seriously and made sure that they supported not just ultra wide, but super ultra wide. This is the first game I have ever played that immediately detected my monitor, by the way, as an HDR monitor and set the peak brightness correctly. And it does look astounding in HDR. That's one of the biggest differences from when I played it on PS4 when I was not gaming in HDR game looks absolutely stunning. Performance for me with everything set to the max with DLSS 3 and frame generation has led to about 170 FPS more or less stable. I had one crash when I first booted up the game and zero crashes after that in a total of eight hours of play. I am playing on a top of the line rig so that does mean a 4090, a 13th gen i9, 64 gigabytes of RAM. I'm playing off an M2 drive keep all of these things in mind. Uh, hopefully one day I will have a secondary machine for testing on a more medium capacity rig, but that day is not here today. So please check out other reviewers, check out comments and user reviews to see how it might perform on your machine. In my case, the game runs flawlessly, which you might say, well, duh, it's a top of the line machine, but you'd be surprised how many games uh, don't run flawlessly, uh, including recent games like Starfield or recent games like Lords of the Fallen that just decided to not run well at all. And that does not seem to be the case here. If there is one complaint that I have is that you cannot cap the FPS within the options of the game. I like to keep my monitor at 240 hertz because I do play some competitive games where I appreciate that. But for a game like this, I don't need it to be running uncapped and hovering around 170 FPS. I would be quite happy capping this anywhere between 60 to 120. And I think it's a good option to have because I can imagine a lot of people with maybe 144 hertz monitors that just don't want to put that pressure on the GPU. Just They just don't need that. This game doesn't really require that much. And it would be perfectly fine playing on 60 FPS or on 90 FPS or something like that. I have encountered some graphical glitches. Some models look a little bit weird in some outfits with some seams showing through. I did have one moment where the fire effect became giant squares. I think I have that footage on hand, but I accidentally recorded it in SDR, so it's going to look terrible, but at least you can see the glitch. And also a lot of strange black bars, black banding, just kind of stretching around the screen when entering and exiting certain cinematics. It's really strange. I've never seen this in any game, I think. But uh, it is there, but it does not affect absolutely anything, to be honest. It just looks kind of ugly at that moment, but not a big deal at all and probably something that they will patch out. When it comes to support, it does work perfectly fine on mouse and keyboard. Your mileage may vary on how comfortable you are playing these sorts of games on mouse and keyboard. And I did test the game on four different controllers, being a third party controller, an Xbox controller, a Switch Pro controller, and of course a DualSense, which it does support natively. However, it does not have the adaptive trigger resistance on the DualSense in a wireless mode, which is really strange because games like Ratchet & Clank and Returnal, while they didn't have it at launch, did patch in the wireless support 
for the adaptive triggers later on. Ghost of Tsushima, according to the PC Gaming Wiki itself, does not support that in wireless. Hopefully that's something that they add later because I don't want to have my DualSense wired to my PC, which in my case is on the other side of the room, just to have the adaptive triggers. But overall, all of the controllers work well. Load times, which I imagine will vary depending on the disk drive that you use, but in my case on an M2 drive are basically non-existent, like maybe a second when fast traveling, which is greatly appreciated, keeps the game flowing very nicely, a game that is already very good in its pacing and world design. Fully rebindable keys, as you might expect. You cannot rebind the controller mappings, but you can tweak them. That is more or less to be expected. And if you're a fan of rebinding your controller, uh, you probably have a controller that allows you to do that on the software side somewhere else. And it's not a standard, so I'm not going to hold that against them for not allowing me to reconfigure the controller in every which way. So overall, yeah, pretty good. Uh, strongly recommend the game either now or later, with one exception, and that is the situation with PlayStation Network. We come from all of the debacle that went down with the Helldivers 2 PSN requirement. This game does have a big red box underneath the purchase option that says that you cannot access the multiplayer features of the Legends mode unless you link a PSN account. If you stand against that, if you don't want to have that account, keep that in mind that you will not access the multiplayer mode because they are requiring it. However, they are actually telling us in advance they are featuring it and it is only required for the multiplayer. Plenty of negative reviews already on Steam because of this reason. If you do not like this trend, if you do not want these games to do that, then be aware. More important is the fact that even though the PSN account is only required for the online mode, the game is not for sale in 177 countries because they do not have PSN services. This means that even though you are only locked out of the multiplayer, you cannot buy the game for its single player. And it's very unfortunate that Sony continues to prove that they have no idea what they are doing with their PC strategy, no matter if it took them four years to port this game to PC. The Legends mode could have been a $10 DLC and they could have knocked the price down of the base version of the game without it, to have the base version sold in all of those areas and just not be able to sell the DLC. They could have just not had this PSN account requirement at all, and they would have made a lot more money by selling this game in all of those regions that cannot access the game at all anymore. They could have maybe figured out at some point that selling your game on a PC platform that sells games worldwide when you have a service that does not operate worldwide and that you want to have as a requirement for your games is just dumb. They could have figured this out many times over and many years ago, but they haven't. So unfortunately, a lot of people have no real way of obtaining this PC game through Steam, and that is very unfortunate. Beyond that, even if you can buy the game, you might stand against this just in morals. So be aware of that restriction. It is there. It is a problem. I am not here to stand against Sony and their account linking at the end of the day they will do what they want and we will vote with our wallets i just hope that they figure it out at some point please just offer something better we expect better beyond that i can't really not recommend the game based on that because i think just the single player part of the game is worth the price of admission even if you ignore the multiplayer and you never link your PSN account, but it does suck for the people who cannot play it and something needs to be done about it. Anyways, that is my review and port report on Ghost of Tsushima for PC. If you enjoyed it, if you liked this video, then like the video, leave a comment below, let me know what you think about Ghost of Tsushima, let me know what you think about the PSN situation. I appreciate you for watching, thank you for doing so, and extra special thanks to my patrons up on the $1 patron wall. It's called like that because there's only one tier at the patron and it is one dollar but every dollar that goes there helps me have less hours at my day job and more hours making videos for you to enjoy i've been mug thief and as always i will see you again very soon